Hello, welcome everybody. My name is Matt Leapsch. I'm one of the owners at Pioneer Midwest, and I am here with uh, two of our managers, uh, Jeremy, who is our chief of service, and Ian, who helps us with uh, wax service and also a lot of retail sales and, and helps with uh, ski fitting. Um, and we are just discussing the 2023 uh, Cordelopit and Berkey, and we're going to go through our wax service, uh, ski selection, uh, grinds, and what was working for structure, and um, I can give a little recap of how things went down in the front, which was uh, basically David Norris launching off the front for a solo <laughs> um, Herculean effort. But anyways, we'll start with Jeremy. Uh, how did it go with setting up for the week and trying to wax you know, hundreds of, of skis? Yeah, this, this year, coming into this year, um, I learned some lessons from last year and I wanted to be a bit more organized on the front end. Um, it meant that it was more busy work for me and less waxing. Um, so I luckily had a, a good team behind me that they were waxing skis and I was uh, in charge of making sure that people's skis didn't get lost, um, that we had a good uh, organized piece uh, there for us ready for, for race day. Um, but uh, a couple things that we changed for this year is that we actually took a look at skis on the front side of things, um, categorized them if we noticed that there was any skis that were on the drier side. We actually ended up putting in an additional layer into those skis to help combat that issue um, going ahead time. Um, in addition, within probably a half hour to an hour of skis getting checked in here, we were already putting in that first layer of uh, start green into the skis. Um, so people that dropped off skis, I mean, Wednesday a week and a half beforehand, uh, we put start green in it knowing that it was probably gonna be on the colder side of things for the Berkey, but even if it wasn't, having a hard, durable layer sit in those bases for a while is going to only help. Um, so we let that, that hard paraffin sit in there uh, on that, that front end of things, um, uh, which is one of the pieces that I think that really, really did help us out, so. Yeah, just from, uh, I, most, of the, most of the staff was up at the, uh, the Berkey most of the week. Um, I stayed back and managed the store here, which was kind of fun, so I didn't leave until Friday evening. Um, so I got to miss a lot of the a lot of the hustle and bustle of the of the Berkey fever, but um, you know I trust my team, so they were able to test test my skis and get them waxed along with everybody else's. And just um, we just were had a really good crew this year, and I think the organization was was quite quite good. Um, I just want to ask you guys if you if you noticed any difference between Berkey and Cordy wax, or was it the same? I mean, it, looking at the long range forecast and leading up to the Berkey, we just knew. It was going to be a green to blue Berkey. It was it looks fresher snow and colder. And my dad's a meteorologist, so he was making pretty correct calls on what the weather was going to do. So we felt confident a pretty long ways out that it, we weren't going to be dealing with um, with wetness or moisture. We were going to be dealing with with friction. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. So unfortunately, we weren't able to do a ton of valuable testing before the Cordy. Um, that snow happened on Wednesday into that Thursday, um, meaning that there was basically nothing that we could learn by testing Wednesday for Thursday or for Thursday for Friday's Cordy. Um, so the conditions were, were dr drastically different on that Thursday, which just was kind of a little frustrating, but that's the way it is in racing. And um, the one nice thing is we have years and years of experience uh, waxing, testing, knowing these products that we could put on very safe options for those races where we don't have the ability to test. Um, but luckily going into to Friday, we had the ability to test on, on Friday um, and then Saturday and, and Ian was actually even able to, uh, to test uh, during the night, um, well, it was Friday night or Saturday morning, um, so, some things. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was, it was interesting. We were kind of waxing, packing things up. We were feeling pretty good about it, but then it gets to midnight, one o'clock and we're looking out the window and seeing snow flying. <laughs> man, didn't really expect this, uh-oh. So we're getting ready for bed and realized yeah, we should probably do some testing in the morning. So um, we headed out at, at 3 a.m. And, and went to double O and it was, yep, there's about two inches of fresh snow on the, on the course and they were done grooming at that time. Um, so it was not gonna be super hard packed or set up very well, it was gonna be pretty soft. So we tested four different waxes. Um, so Swix Marathon, NF21, TSP5, and then Marathon with a little bit of graphite. Um, they were all actually running pretty well, so we were we felt pretty confident with our decisions that we had made, and we weren't going to be 
you know, way off or anything or need to panic wax anybody's keys or anything like that. So um, it was, we found kind of a, that good best option and then we're able to just roll with it. So. Yeah, and I think the biggest thing that we learned from that testing was that, that new snow coming down at colder temperatures, that's when graphite can start to play sometimes. So we yep. wanted to just make sure like, okay, is graphite going yep. to make a, a difference? And it actually was a, uh, from what Ian was telling yep. me, I wasn't out testing at that point. Um, it actually slowed the skis down. Yep. Um, so we, we were happy that we did not add um, that black additive into the testing um, or into the, the, the wax mix um, ahead of yep. time. And that's something that we, we do hear quite frequently at, at Pioneer with our race service is we try to just make sure that we're giving safe options. Put the ball over the plate and let the, uh, let the, the skis and the athlete do the work. Um, so by adding a graphite additive, yes, we could have maybe made an increase of 5% in the ski speed, but we also could drag that down by 20 to 30% if it doesn't work. Um, so we don't, we don't like taking those risks uh, when we uh, have the ability to avoid them. So Yeah, and it sounds like um, a lot of the elite teams that we've talked to um, were on the same products that we, that we were on. And, yep. and so there's a few, like I know Marathon and TSP5 were both on the podium in both mm -hmm. races, and that's, you know, and we had, you know, the NF21 under, you know, under stuff, and that was working really well. So we had, mm -hmm. we had uh, our, our, our wax service people and me were on the same products as the, the winners and podium people yeah. as the race, which is, which, is, uh, which is good to see. So we were, you know, we, with, with the type of snow that we, what we saw, you know, we, you could, you, you, um, you could definitely pick the wrong thing and, and, and ruin <laughs> someone racing, yeah. but we were, you know, we were in the, we were in the, in the right lane for, 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 for putting uh, good wax on the skis. Um, and from what I could tell, most of the front group was pretty much comparable on ski speed. Um, it was just hard work. Um, if, uh, luckily, if we, if we hadn't got, if we hadn't gotten that new snow, I think it would have been really probably 10, 15 minutes faster, maybe for, for the, for uh, the front group, um, but uh, there was that yeah, inch of new snow just laying in the track, and that's um, pretty slow to ski on. And I noticed a pretty big difference in speed, just being, you know, at times when I was skiing at the very front of the front of the race, um, in brand fresh new snow. Um, I mean, the, the females had gone over some of it, but even when I went to the back of the elite group, and you know, I'm 15, 20 guys back, and then you're in more glaze, and it was faster. So it was a pretty big difference, and that made it so impressive that um, David Norris just. Uh, you know, launched off the front at, at 3k and, and held it to the finish line and I I thought about going with him but he was you know playing a sport that I haven't played in 10 years and that was a you know top 20 world cup speed type skiing <laughs> so yeah. it was 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 quite quite impressive and I think the a, you know a big thing on 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 ski selection and and uh, grind selection was um having a universal cold to a, a cold ski was important mm -hmm. and then also the, the health of your of your grind so um like I said, Jeremy cataloged a bunch of skis that, every ski that came in, we kind of gave it a score of how the bases looked. And mm -hmm. unfortunately, we don't have time, Berkey week, to turn the stone grinder on and, and regrind skis for people. Um, we're just so busy waxing, we, we can't do that. But we, we made a conscious effort to catalog everybody's base health and try to correlate that to the, the, the feedback that we're getting. And, and, um, and we knew this from past years, that if you have a healthy base material, it, it's, it's much much faster especially in the age of non-floral waxes your your base is really intimately in, you know touching the snow in the past you could floral powder and that would create kind of a uh, an eggshell of florals over the base so you could kind of take a, a ski that was not maintenanced well and neglected and sealed shut a little bit and you could still kind of produce good speed on out of them um, without with uh, with the non-floral waxes that's not really a, a, a choice anymore you have to have healthy base material and um, I'll let Jeremy and, and you talk maybe about structure testing or what they found. But I, I personally, I went on our SC1 grind. Um, that's what um, Brian went on as well. I think Caitlin Gregg did too. It's just a very good universal cold grind. Um, and we, but I'll let you guys talk about a little hand structure that we did or didn't do. And yeah, so I, I guess I can I can speak on the uh, the grinds um, uh, side of things. So for for the Cordy with that that newer fresher snow, cold temperatures. Um, the SC zero grind probably would have been the best option that we, that we have SC one being very close behind that. Um, but as we got into Saturday with, uh, um, that, that snow getting groomed in again, um, 
thousands of people being on it the, the day before. Yes, even though we did get a little bit of that fresh stuff on top, um, slightly warmer temperatures meant that that SC1 or SC0 are both really good options. Um, so we've had uh, great feedback from both, uh, both options on that day. Um, even we've had uh, some, some people on our SC2 grind um, were, were happy with that choice, um, which came down to probably just had a really good pair of skis. Yeah. And then also, um, I think that grind did better in the second half of the race, though, yes. as, it, as the sun came out and warmed yes. up. Is what yeah. my feedback from people that went on the, the yeah. number two grind yeah. said it was So that okay. second half of the race, once yeah. you got two double O, again, more traffic, more groomed in. Yeah. That's where that's where it really shined. Um, and then uh, part of that testing that we did uh, that night before, Ian was able to do some yeah. um, some testing. Yeah, yeah. Like that. So we did test some structure as well. Um, we kind of went on just like our on off of our SC1 grind. So no structure. And then like the Red Creek minus five, minus 15 tool in the tail. And then the minus five, minus 20 in the, in the tail as well. And then on full length of the ski as well. Um, really the best things that it came down to was just our straight up SC1 grind was really sweet. Yeah. Um, adding that minus five, minus 15 to the tail of the ski, especially on some skis that didn't seem to have as, you know, a fresh of a grind or something really seemed to help a little bit. Yeah. Um, yeah. Going full length of the ski did seem to slow it down just a little bit. It was just yeah. a little grabby, especially out at double O. Once you got onto the um, the south end where the cordy had happened, it really seemed to there seemed to be a, just a little bit more dirt in that snow. So we were a little worried about that. So um, really, just went with that minus five, minus yeah. fifteen on the tail it was super safe and, and yeah. And, and for the a for the for the elite wave people, it probably would have been best to have no structure on those skiers that are in the top five or top 10 skiing over the brand new fresh stuff. Yep. But as soon as you start getting back, as Matt mentioned, it started to blaze. blaze a little bit. Yep. And then adding that structure to the back half or the tails of the ski um, really did help. And by the time that I went out and skied in the, the seventh <laughs> wave, <laughs> structure. <laughs> structure was good. Yeah. Um, but again, like, like Ian mentioned, that full length structure um, over 50K could potentially pick up some dirt um, throughout the race. Um, so having it just on the, the back half gave you that that extra little uh speed boost um in the chopped up snow without the liability of having full length structure so yeah no that's um that, that, that makes a makes a lot of sense for sure um well i think that covered glide wax and and, and structure and ski selection choice um i'll just talk on ski selection uh quick it seemed like um in our top group, we had guys that were on kind of universal base skis, um, but they were colder profile universal base skis. And then we had some that were on cold bases. I was on a Solomon Blue base again this year, same pair I used last year. David Norris was on, a, on an S1, which is the Razi cold base ski. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, Tyler Cornfield had a great race. I noticed he was on a pair of Solomon universal base skis. Um, so, and then there's, um, and Brian Gregg was just on, uh, I think I think he's on his F3, which is a colder yep. Machu ski. So it, it and every, you know, it, a lot of the guys, so there's a lot of different brands that seem like they, they ran pretty well, but I think the thing that put you, you know, was having a high quality ski was, was important and then leaning the camber just a little bit colder and then having a healthy, clean grind was important. Um, I wanted to ask you guys about uh, kick wax because we didn't cover that yet. So yes. kick for a quarter whoop it, kick for Berkey. Me, I don't even really think about that because I'm just skating it. So <laughs> I haven't, yeah. I haven't, uh, I haven't uh, classic race in Sealy Hill, but I, I didn't wanted to have your thoughts on. Yeah, on that was wax. that was something that um, for kickwax is such an important part of those those classic skiers um, that we do make a conceited effort to test both morning of Cordy and of Berkey, um, giving good options there for those that uh, need a panic wax or need a need a little extra at the end. Um, and really for both days, what we noticed um, from a very broad perspective, if you put down a green or a blue from most companies and covered it with a green from most companies, you're probably gonna be in the ballpark. Um, it's fairly simple, simple waxing. Um, the things that we noticed really did hurt skis out was anything with a clister additive. Um, so come down to that, that base binder, if you had like a super base or Rex Liquid Base, Start Extra Base, any of those those binders that are really durable binders that most people put on for marathon races, they have a little bit of extra clister added into it, um, slowed the skis down quite a bit. Um, still got good kick, but they were noticeably slower. Um, so looking at the bases like a, a Rex Base or Bouty AT Base, um, even Toco Green Binder, uh, the, the Swix, uh, 
uh, VG30 or VG35. None, none of those have a significant amount of clister added into it. Um, help you keep the, the wax on your skis, but also keep it moving well. Move skiing fast. It seemed it seemed fairly straightforward for for kick wax on Cordelopit yep. on and and Berkey. I talked to a few people that did the open track, um, and that seemed to be a mix of the grooming just wasn't as great that day, mm -hmm. um, and then there was some wind blown snow, so it, it kind of went in from like wind blown new new snow to then like icy tracks, and so that was I think a pretty tough yeah. tough day. You could um. Those with kick wax, you know, had to re-wax a few times. And then yeah. I think maybe you can talk about how skin skis work for, you know, open track versus Cordy versus Berkey. I, I've heard positives and negatives on, on skins, it seems. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I thought from what it sounded like, one of our employees was on his skin skis for the open track and just loved them the whole time. Um, yeah. He thought they were he thought they were great. Um, I guess for, for me, it seemed like Cordy Berkey day was you could put on a lot of things if you wanted kicked all the time just that blue or if you wanted to get a little faster cover that with green mm -hmm. it seemed like waxable classics were were, were a really good. easy way to go yeah. on on both Cordy and That's... Berkey day um, skins are still going to be great if you don't want to mess with the kick wax but mm -hmm. uh, probably a little bit slower on both of those days compared to a, a well waxed waxable classic yeah and I'm assuming the customers that did use a skin ski if they had an adjustable binding yeah. on the ski that was That's probably huge. pretty helpful yeah. to yeah. kind of dial in that perfect kick and glide combination yep 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 so yeah. um uh well I think that's it unless you guys had any other well I think that there's one last piece is that customers really want to hear how your race went yeah <laughs> <laughs> I mean well, they don't so, care about me or, or Ian it's, yeah, it's well, how, how, how do you uh, adventure ski so yeah. I'm <laughs> I uh, was very happy to do my 20th Berkey, so I had a purple bib on, which was I was very proud of and showed it off a lot during the race. Probably a little, <laughs> probably a little too much. Um, the purple bibs, um, they don't look like it, but they're really heavy, so that kind of slowed me down a little bit. <laughs> but um, yeah, no, I was uh, ninth overall, which is good for uh, for an older guy. I like to try to ski with the young, the young bucks as long as I can. Um, I probably should have trained more this summer and fall, but uh, I kind of got into Berkey training, you know, serious Berkey training once we hit the new year. And yeah, it, it was just, it was super fun. My skis were, were competitive. Um, I, you know, I went with my Solomon Blues as a pretty cold ski. They were, I think, one of the best pairs in the field in the first half. And I needed that to get up and over all the big hills. I probably could have, my universal pair may have been a little better in the end of the race, but um, by then I'm already cooked, so it doesn't really matter what I'm, <laughs> what I'm on. As long as I can get the double O with the with the top group, then I can kind of get sucked along for another 15K of, of, of free skiing. It's kind of purgatory part of the race where you, nobody can get away. Um, but, um, but uh, yeah, no, the, and then the, um, uh, the young guys started uh, attacking, uh, uh, somebody, somebody attacked up Bitch Hill pretty hard. And that's where I came unglued a little bit, but um, I knew, I, you know, and I told some of the guys around me, you know, when we went up Mosquito Brook, I was like, all right, this is the, point in the race where the gloves come off and we start punching each other in the face <laughs> and so uh, I knew it was going to get uh, get really hard again on those last hills and um but I um I didn't I knew I didn't have the legs to accelerate um for the podium but uh so I just kind of tried to ski within myself and limit the bleeding which I think I did really well so the next hill um coming out of fish hatchery usually I feel terrible on that and I was able to v2 most of that um not fast but I was able to <laughs> <laughs> maintain like just a good steady uh, good steady tempo. Um, I know I was cramping pretty good at the end of the race. Um, and the lake was uh, into a headwind at first, and then you kind of turn, and then it was kind of pushing you. So that was that was um, that was that was super nice. So I'm uh, I was I was I was pumped with my race. I think if I had spent less time leading at times and and been very conservative, um, maybe I could have placed a little higher. But it's uh, you know any given Sunday, so it was kind of. I was I was pretty happy with, very happy with how it went, and then um, I was watched the first preem play out because they give you five hundred dollars at the two point five or two point three or some some mark, and I uh, a couple of guys were, were sprinting very very fast for that for that preem, and um, and uh, I was slightly slightly off the back of that. You could watch me on the video. I was just kind of there as playing defense because I'm like, well, somebody might try to creep up behind him and launch an attack once we go through the, the, the finish line. And they, 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 and David did, he came around me and was pushing really hard to get up there. And I didn't think he wanted to try to compete for the, for the preem sprint, you know, cause he's not really a sprinter. Um, but he, I could just tell he wanted to be positioned to kind of just blast right through that, um, 
that cream. And so he, he did, and I was matching pretty closely. Um, I had a little gap to him, and um, he started to, we started climbing after that, and uh, he was skiing very fast, and um, I had a decision to make at that point in time, is try to track that down and pull everyone behind me up to him, or um, let somebody else fast come by. And um, I thought going with him would have been a suicide mission for myself. <laughs> I think I could have done it, but I think I would have been cooked by double O. Um, so I, I pulled over Tyler Cornfield, actually bridged to him, which was impressive. Um, he's a really good sprinter, sprinter. So he has got a, that spring. So he was able to create separation from the rest of our group and bridge up to, to David. And he held him for maybe 10 K and then came back to our group. Um, but uh, I was, I was pretty conservative, but at times when we were chasing, I was leading the whole group too much, but I was feeling really good. And I thought maybe David might bonk later in the race or we, you know, we, we might, we might, he might come back to us. It's, um, it's a pretty hard effort to solo for almost 50 K I, I would imagine, <laughs> yep. you know, but he's, um, he was kind of playing a different sport than the rest of us a little bit and just watching how his movement patterns looked it, it looked kind of like top 20 world cup type skiing. Um, so. Yeah. I haven't played that sport for for a few years now, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it was just a super nice day. It was like a green blue Berkey, and the weather was nice. The sun came out at the end. It was just um, I think uh, everybody had a had a good fun time. It was a lot of work. Like it was a slower Berkey for sure. Um, it was a party back in wave seven. Yeah, <laughs> it was. Um, you know, we had the V one a lot more than normal. I think um, you you just had to you had to work the whole time. Like it was an no free lunch. You know, if we had raced. Um, the next day, or even if it hadn't snowed overnight, I think it would, like I said, it would have been way, way faster. Um, that could have been really fun too, but um, yeah. it was still a great, a great time. Awesome. Cool. All right. Well, thank you everybody that used our wax service that has shopped with us this year. We really appreciate uh, your support and we just love getting people the best experience they can in the sport.